Well, hey, greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Meshach Canyon. I'm a pastor at Friendship United Methodist Church. And in this message, I'll be wrapping up our study in Daniel chapter 3 on the fiery furnace. If you're interested in listening to the sermon that preceded this one, then you can find the link either on the screen if you're viewing it through a mobile device or in the description section right underneath this video. So you can watch it right after this or watch it right now. It's really up to you. Um, but anyways, on to this sermon. Uh, in the conclusion of Daniel chapter 3, we have the story of how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace because they refused to bow down and worship the statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected. And while they were in the fire, God delivered them in such a remarkable way. Uh, as it goes, as, as Nebuchadnezzar looked on, he noticed that not only were they not suffering in the fire, but they were actually walking around like they were on a casual stroll. And the most shocking part was that a fourth man who had the appearance of uh, what Nebuchadnezzar said, a son of God, was in the fire with them. So this is one of the most popular acts of deliverance in the entire Bible. It's one of those against all odds moments, you know. Uh, th these kind of moments, in my opinion, make for great stories. In fact, the greatest of stories, whether it's a book or a movie or anything else. In fact, as I was preparing for this sermon, I found myself thinking of other movies that have uh, these moments of deliverance against all odds. And two of them immediately came to mind uh, because I just watched them recently. One was Lord of the Rings, the third movie in the uh, installation, and uh, the other was Avengers Endgame. And you might remember at the end of Lord of the Rings, um, when the armies of Middle-earth are surrounded by the armies of Mordor. And from the vantage point of the viewer, it looks like it's going to be a complete rout. But then against all odds, the ring of power is destroyed on this impossible mission, and the power of Sauron and his armies are destroyed with it. And like the story in Daniel 3, deliverance comes in the most unlikeliest of ways. And then in Avengers Endgame, you have what has to be one of the most crowd-pleasing endings in movie history. Near the end, you got Captain America who's beat down and bruised, and he's standing in front of Thanos and his army. And I know I sound like a geek right now, but him being Captain America, he, he starts tightening up his gear, and he's going to go into the battle anyways. As he's walking forward, he hears his friend Sam calling his name in his headset, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the, these portals open up and all these superheroes who vanished five years ago show up and stand alongside Captain America uh, and they even the odds. So what looked like a definite uh, defeat turns into this improbable but fantastic and, and crowd-pleasing victory. Now, I know I'm not the only one that likes scenes like that in, in those movies or in those books. And the reason we like them is because they're hopeful and they always show good overcoming evil against all odds. And on, on a very superficial level, they just make us feel good to witness something like that happening. And that's really the only purpose of the movies. A little inspiration, a little happiness, uh, the feeling that you got your money's worth. That's the goal of those scenes in the movies. We're not really expected to do anything after we've watched uh, Lord of the Rings or Avengers Endgame or something like that. We're supposed to be inspired. We're supposed to admire the characters, but that's it. But when we read the stories of God's deliverance in the Bible, stories like Daniel chapter 3, we are supposed to do something. Because whenever God acts, there's an expectation that those who are aware of his actions will respond appropriately. So today I'd like to discover what the appropriate response might be. And, and we see both the right response and the wrong response by looking at King Nebuchadnezzar. So if we look at what Nebuchadnezzar does in response to what has happened, we'll see what not to do. But by listening to what he says about God, we'll learn what we should do. So let me quickly give a summary again. After Nebuchadnezzar's had our three heroes thrown into the furnace and witnesses that God has delivered them in such a dramatic way, he calls for them to come out of the fire. Then this is what he said. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a, de a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. So what did he say? Well, in keeping with his character, he threatened to kill anyone that talked bad about uh, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he also said that God delivers those who trust in him by serving him with their whole lives and refuse to serve any other God. And then he finishes by saying, no other God can deliver in this way. Now, those are pretty powerful statements for a pagan ruler to make, aren't they? I mean, consider the fact that we're talking about Babylon, a place that was more diverse than any other place on earth at the time because of how many nations Nebuchadnezzar had conquered. That means there are worshipers of almost every religion under the sun in Babylon. It's the most pluralistic country on the face of the earth at that time. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no other God is able to rescue in this way. So I don't want to hear anyone talking bad about the God of the, the Israelites. Now, if you were to just hear what he said, what might you expect him to do in light of what he said? Well, one would be excused if they expected him to become a worshiper of the God he just declared as being the greatest. But what does he do? He just threatens death upon anyone who talks bad about God. That's like discovering a business that's a surefire bet to invest in, but instead of investing in it yourself, just saying to your friends, now listen, I don't want to hear any bad talk about that company or their CEO. Oh, sure, it's respectful and deferential, but when you witness a deliverance of that magnitude and power of that magnitude, it doesn't call for respect, does it? No, it calls for surrender. So why would King Nebuchadnezzar respond in the way that he did, even with the newfound knowledge he had of God? Well, I suppose we could ask the same question of people in our day, can't we? I suppose we can ask it of us, actually. We believe in a story that suggests that God delivered Jesus from the ultimate furnace, namely hell, a deliverance that makes what happened in the fiery furnace of Daniel look like child's play. So why then do most people, including Christians, respond with a kind of respect towards him? The answer is pride. Even though they've heard the story of God's deliverance, they're too prideful to entrust themselves wholly to him. Listen again to what Nebuchadnezzar said. He said that God delivered those who trusted in him even to the point of yielding up their own bodies. So he understood that a relationship with this God would require absolutely everything. It would require a total surrender. And so he opts out. Nebuchadnezzar, he's like a precursor to that rich young ruler uh, who came to Jesus in the Gospels and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was interested as long as he could retain control of his life. So when, when he discovered that it would cost him everything, leave everything, go, leave, go sell everything you have, then come and follow me, the Bible says he went away, yes, with a profound respect for Jesus, but he ultimately went away sad because he didn't want to give it all up to be like Jesus and to be with Jesus. You see, at the end of the day, it's always pride that keeps a person from experiencing God's deliverance. Why? because they think they can deliver themselves with their intellect, with their strength, with their wealth. And the thought of being rendered helpless and receiving aid from another person mitigates against everything that the prideful person stands for. So Nebuchadnezzar discovered that there's a God who can deliver from the worst of life's furnaces, but he refused to experience that deliverance because, as we'll see in chapter 4, he was way too prideful. And what about you? How would you describe your relationship with God? Is it a respectful acknowledgement that actually keeps God at arm's length? Or is it a humble submission and surrender that places him at the center of your life? So that's Nebuchadnezzar. He chose to acknowledge in a respectful way that God is powerful, but in his actions, he chose not to surrender to that powerful God. But on the flip side, for those exiled Judeans who heard this story, it would have been like a shot in the arm for them because they didn't have the securities to rely on like Nebuchadnezzar and other powerful people in Babylon may have. So their options were only twofold, bow down and trust in the mercy of Nebuchadnezzar or remain standing and trust in the mercy of God. 
And I'm sure that many of them out of fear probably did bow down the first few times they heard the music being played. And some of them probably just stayed in the house to avoid being caught outside when the music was being played because they didn't know what they would do. But all of them must have been thinking, here we are in this foreign land being ordered to serve foreign gods. I know that our scriptures promise God's protection, but will he really rescue us? Will he really be with us? And that, I believe, is where many Christians live their lives today, trapped between knowing that the Bible promises God's presence and deliverance in the midst of our furnaces, but also living in a world that says, if you bow down to what we have to offer, you'll be safe from the furnaces of life. And with all the offers of safety and protection, we have a situation where many Christians believe in God in a respectful kind of way. They have a tremendous respect for God. But when the music begins playing, it's evident that they trust themselves and they trust the others who promise safety. So just picture it. You have these exiles. They're terrified of whether to bow the knee to Nebuchadnezzar's statue or remain standing and face the furnace. Then all of a sudden, this story starts making its way back to their town saying, there were three exiles, three of our brothers who refused to bow the knee and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But rather than being burned, God delivered them. God was with them and God rescued them. Man, look, this would have encouraged them so much to stand firm and to stand and have lives full of faith. And I hope it does the same for you too, because this isn't just a feel-good story with a great ending like uh, Avengers Endgame. Rather, it's a reminder to all of God's people that God will be with you and deliver you in the furnace, in the fire. As Nebuchadnezzar wisely observed but didn't do, he said nobody can deliver like he can. It was true in, Nebuchadnezzar, in Nebuchadnezzar's day, and it's true in Jesus's day, and it's certainly true in our day. And because... Man, because all the events of, of these past few weeks, they've caused me to brush up on history a little bit, man. And, and I've been encouraged to see God's people throughout the ages, not, not only in the Bible, but beyond Scripture, entrusting themselves to God in the face of the threatening furnaces of their day. From William Wilberforce, who faced intense opposition when fighting to make slave trading illegal, it would have been far easier for him to bow down to his detractors and accept the offers that were coming his way, offers that would guarantee him certain positions and safety and all those things. But instead, he sided with God and chose the furnace. And because he chose the furnace, God delivered him and so many other people who would have been enslaved through the fires and through the furnace. And what about Harriet Tubman, that saint who literally saw the temperature of the furnace increasing with the prize of her capture going up on each wanted sign every time she, she brought a group back to the north. Friends from the north were literally begging her to just remain in the place where she was safe. But instead, she chose the fire with God and, and, and she chose the furnace of the racist south. And because she entrusted herself to God, God delivered hundreds of people from the fires with her. And I don't have time to talk about other abolitionists like Abraham Lincoln, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., or the thousands of unnamed victims of lynchings, both physical and psychological, that chose to enter the fire with God rather than bowing to the pressures of safety that were offered to them in their day. It encourages me, like, like I'm sure the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego must have encouraged the exiles of their day to stand for God and to stand with God, even if it meant that the fire was going to be heated up, even if it meant ridicule and censor, and I dare say even if it meant the loss of life. Because one way or another, whether in this life or the start of the next life, everyone who entrusts themselves to God will experience the deliverance of God. Well, look, let me be quiet because I could preach on this all day. You're lucky we're not in the sanctuary right now because this would be a 45-minute sermon. Here's the last word. The stories of God's deliverance, whether they're to be found in human history or, or in the Bible or anything, they're not given to make us feel respect towards God. Those stories are there to remind us that people in, in days gone past have entrusted themselves to God in the face of the furnace 
and God was with them. And somehow or another, God delivered them. And if you and I surrender entirely to God, God will deliver us too. Amen.